Hello, it's Alec Falk here, music director of Esprit, and I'm so pleased to have with me for this uh, conversation, Scott Wilson, composer um, of um, a work that is, is of a nature that we relish at Esprit Orchestra because we want to extend the dimensions of what we do. Uh, the piece includes electronics and video blended with orchestra, but it has also many other special relationships involved with it. Um, so Scott, welcome and um, tell us a little bit about the origins of, of the project. Um, yes, hi, so it's really nice to be here. Um, so the, the piece is called Dark Matter and um, it's, it was kind of um, uh, a sort of uh, later development of something that started as a, an electronic music project. Um, uh, a friend and um, colleague, collaborator of mine, Konstantinos Vasilakos, who's a Greek um, electronic music composer, he uh, had originally met uh, another Greek man, um, Angelos Alexopoulos, who works at the Art at CMS project at CERN, the, where the Large Hadron Collider, the world's biggest particle um, accelerator is. Uh, and they have a kind of art project there that's associated with that um, experiment. And so we started working with them and we developed a kind of uh, project where we were taking the data from, uh, from the Large Hadron Collider, so the data from the particle collisions, and we were sonifying them, turning them into sound and into music. Um, and we were doing this um, in real time, sort of improvising by programming these sonifications in real time. Um, and that was something that we found um, quite um, a rewarding uh, experience. And, we, and also we were interested in the way that audiences found it quite rewarding. Because I think that, um, you know, I was trained a little bit traditionally and, you know, and I was taught, um, you know, not without, not completely uncritically, but taught about the sort of 19th century abstract versus program music thing. Um, so it was quite interesting for me when we went in and we, we told people that we were, um, you know, using this data to turn it into music. And it just seems so compelling for them and so interesting to have that as a kind of, uh, like a scaffold or something to hang their experience off of. And it just made it really engaging. So I thought this is really, um, uh, you know, something, something interesting that I'd like to explore more. What is uh, sonification? I mean, explain what that is. I mean, you know, uh, uh, we, we might have a general sense of what that means, but yeah. uh, specifically, so it kind of refers to like a, um, a, a variety of approaches, simply taking um, some kind of data or information and, and turning it into sound or music. And you can use it scientifically. So you can think of it as being like a visualization of some data, so making a graph, but instead we're making it into sound. But you can also use it for artistic purposes. And people, lots of, lots of artists and composers are interested in this. Um, and you, uh, there's different approaches to it. The one that I was mostly working with uh, was this one called parameter mapping, where basically you have some aspect of the data. Um, so for instance, with this data, we have um, the information about the subatomic particles that have kind of shot off from the collision and what direction they were going and what the velocity was and um, maybe a little bit about how heavy they were and things like this. So you can take one parameter of that and say, use it to generate pitch or use it to generate duration, so how long a note or a sound could be, or you could, you could map it to anything really you want. Um, and so there's a lot of um, uh, choice in that, in terms of, of what you're doing, but it's also, you know, you can have, just as you can have bad visualizations and good visualizations, you could have good sonifications in the sense that they bring out meaningful um, or salient or kind of relevant or unique aspects of, of the data. Uh, does that make sense? A really interesting part of, of um, our, our um, program was your inclusion of a visual component. And uh, while the, the, the music was absolutely fascinating, but uh, the visual component was as well. And, and uh, so we had, uh, so people know, we had a, a screen behind the orchestra with projections of um, visualization as opposed to sonification of the same data. Uh, can you talk about how, how you conceive this uh, blending of, of music and visuals? Yes, so um, 
firstly, the visualizations were things, um, again, also that I, I programmed um, and were, they were kind of pre-rendered. Uh, and they, they, they vary, um, so they're, they're creative, artistic visualizations rather than sort of scientific ones. CERN actually does scientific ones, but some of them are not a million miles away from what the kind of visualizations they would have at CERN, where you basically have, um, for instance, in the last movement, um, there's these sort of chandelier-like um, structures which are spinning around, and, and there really are like the, representing the, 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 the arrangement of the subatomic particles and their position uh, uh, in, in the way that the, the accelerator detected it. Um, other ones are more abstract, so they're not sort of mapping that so directly. Um, uh, the, in the, the, the very first movement, and, and also comes back later, there's some that are intended to evoke um, cloud chambers, which I don't know if you've ever seen these, but they're, uh, uh, if, you, if you just Google them, there's videos of them. They're really early particle accelerators, and they um, they sort of uh, detect things. I think it was in water vapor, if I remember correctly, or in a gas. Like, I don't remember exactly how it works, but they're very, very beautiful. This kind of sense of like a little bit of mist showing where the particles went. Um, so those are um, happen in different ways in different parts of the piece. Um, and uh, in some cases, the way that they worked was that I would um, generate a sonification uh, of a particular particle collision and then I would capture the time data and information from that and when which uh, bits of, of the subatomic particles were, were effectively sonified and then use that to generate the, um, the visualization. Um, so I, that they I, really sync up very closely with the visuals and the sound. I, I think the fact that uh, CERN has uh, an artistic branch to it mm -hmm. is a fascinating thing. It's quite visionary and um, it, it connects uh, many people and many uh, uh, organizations with the universe and beyond, <laughs> as well as humanity. Um, I, I find that fascinating. And if that principle was extended to other institutions of all kinds, we'd have a really interesting artistic world around us. Um, mm. And uh, how did you get connected with these people? Uh, at, at, yes, well, tell, tell us about that particular artistic uh, part of, of CERN. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's well, they actually, I mean, they're, they're very good at, they have a number of, 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 of art programs basically associated with CERN. And I think you're, you're quite right. They're really committed to this idea and also to just outreach and being part of a community and, and kind of, and actually bringing science to people. Um, so the, uh, the, the particular program we were involved in was called Art at CMS, and CMS is one of the two biggest experiments on the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and uh, they, uh, so, so Konstantinos Vasilakos, who I mentioned, who I'd worked with before, he met this guy, um, Engelos Alexopoulos, and he worked with uh, Michael Hook, who's a, um, a photographer and artist himself, but runs the Art at CMS program. So we just started talking to them about how to do this. And they, uh, they have a number of things that they do. They do a lot of visual art. Um, Michael, for instance, as a photographer, has done a lot of work on just photographing the collider, which is actually very beautiful. The experiments are actually physically, visually very beautiful themselves. Um, but, but mostly they had things where people would respond to the physics or respond to the idea of this physic, the physics or respond to the, their inspiration about the, the project or something and the kind of, you know, quite quick, heroic idea of searching for understanding of the nature of the universe. Um, and um, they were really excited actually when we said that we would want to use their data because people by and large didn't do that. When you say we, you should uh, explain that. It, originally this, this uh, was aimed at having a laptop group involved with yeah. Yeah. That's right. So we've we've um, we, the the first first version of this was like that. Um, you know, uh, later on did the orchestra piece. We still do the laptop thing. We actually just did it last week. But um, they uh, yeah they were very happy. So so sort of in a way like that had became a kind of laboratory. We've we've performed that over and over again in different ways, um, and uh, it was a very nice relationship with art at CMS. They they put us in touch with a physicist. Um, Maurizio Pirini and uh, we got to work with him and eventually we got to go out to CERN and actually meet him and work with him a bit and they had a kind of um, summer kind of uh, vernissage, a big party where people would perform and do uh, 
present art pieces, perform, do different things. Uh, so we got to play for about 800 physicists, which was quite, quite fun. Or utopian. <laughs> yes, yes, very much so. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, it, it is a kind of wonderful thing. And as I said, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, just trying to gush when I say it's heroic. I think there's something really wonderful about it. And it's also incredibly, incredibly international. And it's collaborative. It's, it's you know, um, uh, the, the last movement of, of the piece is called Tapestries. And that's a reference to a, a quote about, um, uh, about modern physics, which is really that it's, 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 you know, thousands of people weaving together all these threads to make this picture. And that is also wonderful. Uh, when we went there, they were very excited because they had the first Iranian physicist had come to work with them. I mean, it's really, it's just, uh, it's very, very collaborative. Um, you know, so also uh, I think they're happy, to, the artist in a way is just a kind of, bringing an artist is just another extension of that in some sense. It, it, it's probably um, much easier for physicists and uh, scientists and, and people in general to think of collisions, of particle collisions and, and space and uh, transformations of physical matter uh, in visual terms um, and uh, probably less so to imagine these things in musical terms. So how did you go about selecting the kinds of sounds that, that you would link to, to um, these ideas, uh, visuals and data? Oh, oh, data itself is quite abstract in a way uh, and um, so to connect that to the abstraction that is musical thinking uh, how, how did you do that how did you make selections and how and think about the output yeah so i mean as i said there's a sort of um in the type of approach i was using there's a kind of mapping thing so you have um some kind of sound synthesis um, method that you're using and it has some kind of parameters so you're taking aspects of the data and using them to generate aspects of the synthesis like pitch or timbre or how loud it is or how long the sound is or rhythms uh, etc um, so a lot of it was um, a bit exploratory um, and trying out with creative choices I mean some of the things were things that I had developed previously with the laptop ensemble um, but I would just work with them and modify them and try to find something that I liked and also something that um, gave me something that I just wouldn't have necessarily come up with. I really like the things that surprised me, if, if that makes sense. It, you know, and I think this is this kind of idea, um, you know, I mean, I guess it's a little bit like, uh, like John Cage or something, this idea that, you know, by putting in something, whether it's the data or something that you can't completely... Um, predict it, it but, gives but, you this. and from there i mean from from what you have from that process then uh, did it extend into um kind of improvisation with that data and and the sounds that resulted or um did you try to take that what you you heard originally from that process and then begin to shape it immediately or was there improvisation in between? Um, yeah, so there'd be um, improvisation in terms of adjusting the, the, the synthesis and the mapping, so changing what the, what the sonification was, but I never, I never fixed it or anything like that. Um, so I would just play with it until I got something I liked and sometimes I would adjust those things to see what I got. Um, but uh, so, you know, I had um, at this point um, a number of, of these, you know, fragments of electronic music. Uh, and from there, I would um, somewhat more freely with the or orchestral stuff, I would write things that were in, sometimes were very, you know, very straightforwardly generated. I mean, I actually had some sonifications which generated musical notation as well. Uh -huh. uh, but often I would write things that, that were inspired by or accompanied or counterpoint to or worked around or were in response to what had been generated by the, the data. So there was more freedom there in the way that I worked. But, uh, but I should just say, I mean, all of this for me was, it wasn't like a very rigid, like, I, I have this procedure and I have to stick to it. I was going back and forth and up and down between, you know, generating things and responding to them and responding to them and then changing the way I generated it and then imagining something else. And I, I recall that when we first uh, began talking about this collaboration, uh, we, we were thinking about relating to the uh, 
output of data from CERN in real time. Uh, how would that have worked? <laughs> I mean, because uh, you would be dealing, you'd be dealing with something coming at you quite immediately and have to respond to it in the in the concert hall. Uh, what, what was your concept? I mean, uh, it didn't end up being that. <laughs> we ended up using uh, data already collected from uh, the, the preceding time. But but if we had done that, how would how would you have dealt with that? Um, That's quite interesting. I mean, I wouldn't mind giving it a go. You know, if if it, yes, <laughs> maybe maybe we could. I think um, <laughs> now that we have um, this under the belt, as it were, it might be a little bit um, a little bit more safe to try that. Um, I mean, it was something that we talked about with the people there, um, you know, also with the, with the laptop group. Um, they were very, everybody thought this was a really great idea and really cool. Um, there's two problems with it. One is political and the other is practical. So the, the political one is that the, the data from CERN is all ultimately public, but they, 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 it is kind of not cooked, but it's kind of processed and formatted and presented in a very particular way. And the, the data that we were working with was this thing called the scouting stream, which was sort of first pass at, um, you, know, um, for, you know, collecting possibly interesting events in terms of new physics and discovering, uh, you know, new, uh, new aspects of physics. Um, and they didn't want that data to get out. Now, of course, we weren't going to give it to anybody, but they didn't want it to get out, one, because somebody else might write a paper about it or try to use it before mm -hmm. they had the chance to. Uh, and the other thing was the practical one that, you know, the, the I mean, I didn't, I didn't realize this before I started with this, but the way this thing works is they, they turn it on and they sometimes leave it on for weeks, you know, and it's just, it's just collision after collision after collision. There's massive amounts of data, but then sometimes they have to turn it off. And unfortunately, if we had a concert going on and they decided to turn it off, I mean, <laughs> I don't think they would probably leave it on for us. So we'd have to have a, a backup in any case. Uh -huh. And then there were various other things, but you'd have to have a computer inside their firewall, which was streaming it out. But you, you could do it. Um, uh -huh. In practice, I mean, with the orchestra piece, because, you know, because just the nature of doing orchestra pieces and, you know, rehearsal time and it's, you know, the resources and uh, commitment involved from everybody, you want to make sure everything's going to work and it's going to be really, um, you know, so it was all kind of pre-selected and, and pre-done. There was some flexibility in uh, the performance of course, it wasn't, you know, like a completely fixed electronic part in that sense, but, uh, but, uh, you know, with the, with the laptop, mm -hmm. we often work with files of, 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 you know, several thousand particle collisions, and we might be selecting which ones to sonify randomly. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things we often do is set up a sonification and then put in different collisions and see how they, they change, which is quite an interesting thing to do as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, it would be it would still be quite fun to do. Um, <laughs> and, sure and, and further to that, to yeah. to create an environment which is um, more um, a, a greater kind of uh, surround sound, surround visual environment than than what we were able to do in a concert hall. I mean, it's a highly expensive thing to to have many many screens surrounding an audience and have all of the sound. Um, around too. Uh, and in fact, uh, that as well, I'd like to explore uh, at a later date to have more than just one screen sitting above and behind the orchestra, ha have more of a, an embracing visual environment to accompany the sonic one. Yeah, it's a bit, uh, that would be wonderful. I mean, it's, it's a very, it's also really interesting. I mean, I, I know you're interested in this too, just putting orchestras in different environments. Um, Concert halls are wonderful, but just thinking yeah. about how people can experience them in different ways is also quite quite yeah. an exciting thing. Yeah. Well, isn't it? Yeah. well, Scott, um, it was such a pleasure having you with us, uh, explaining a bit about your piece, and um, I look forward to doing the work again. I, I really want to perform it once more, well, at least once more. <laughs> and um, thank you for being with us and uh, giving us some insight into your piece. Well, thank you very much for asking me to do this. It's a great pleasure. Pleasure.